Right. Should we give it a minute or how are we feeling on timing, Heather? I think we can, we can go ahead and get started. It's 3.45. So. All right. Excellent. All right. Um, excellent. Okay. So go ahead and kick it off. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Christina Honow. I'm the policy engagement fellow at Compass and I'm one of the co-organizers of this panel and I want to introduce um, my co-host Heather and let her briefly introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Heather Mannix. I am the Assistant Director for Policy Engagement at Compass based in the uh, Washington DC area. So on behalf of both of us um, and our distinguished panelists, I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for a conversation we've titled Supporting and Elevating Diverse Scientific Voices in the Federal Policy Spaces. Um, before going any further, I want to very briefly introduce our esteemed panelists. They will introduce themselves in more depth shortly, but we have Andres Jimenez of Green 2.0, Dr. Vijay LeMay of the Natural Resources Defense Council, Catalina Martinez of the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration, and James Rattling Leaf Sr. of the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I want to offer an acknowledgement that I am calling into this session from downtown Washington, D.C., which are the ancestral lands of the Nakashtonk peoples, anglicized as Anacostian, and the Piscataway tribes. Uh, I offer this acknowledgement and recognition of their historical and traditional presence, as well as their contributions to the region, along with their erasure from Western dialogues and histories due to genocide and displacement by colonial settlers and the government of the U.S. Additionally, as the following discussion addresses diversity, equity, and inclusion in the federal government, I also want to acknowledge the role of the role enslaved peoples, both Black and Indigenous, have played in the building of the structures of federal policy, which lie on the traditional Nakashtan clans here in DC. Lastly, I recognize the presently ongoing struggle of Indigenous activists and leaders in DC to protect their lands and existence, who continue to be met with violence from police politicians and the structures of federal policy, even today and yesterday. Um, so who is Compass? Who are we and why are we hosting this conversation? Compass is a science communication nonprofit that champions, connects, and supports diverse science leaders to improve the well being of people and nature. Heather and I are part of the solutions team here at Compass, meaning we work to put science communication into action by connecting scientists with policymakers and helping prepare them to make these impactful and lasting connections. And our goal at Compass is to support diverse science leaders in engaging in policy discussions. And the majority of our work has focused on the federal policy and decision-making spaces. We've seen a big change with the Biden administration in the discussion specifically around expertise, the role of science, and the inclusion of traditionally marginalized voices and ways of knowing. However, we know the challenges remain and that there is incredible progress still to be made, particularly when compared to the progressive institutions and spaces that we have seen and heard about during this inclusive SciComm symposium. We want to offer this space today for discussion about this moment in time and the current political landscape within the United States, as well as to think about what it means to create long lasting change in how traditionally marginalized groups engage with federal policy and how other forms of knowledge, science and history can be communicated to the federal government inclusively. If you were able to attend Dr. Max Lieberon's keynote speech on Thursday, then you heard them state that the pursuit of inclusion does not directly equate to anti-colonial or decolonial action. However, as Dr. Lieberon also highlighted, inclusion can be impactful and see real change happen when enough seats at the table are held and used by those who have traditionally been excluded. Some of the topics we hope to discuss are what is this opportunity that we have before us? What is the policy window, so to speak? What barriers still remained? Where is systemic change needed? What types of knowledge and voices are still needed? And what can individuals do to change this exclusionary dynamic that still exists today? And lastly, um, and most importantly, for scientists and science leaders who want to engage in federal policy, how can we best support them? We hope to shed some light on what needs to be done in order to ensure everyone's voices at the table are heard and taken for the valuable sources of information and insight that they are. Additionally, we hope to identify ways that we can begin to provide greater support, both structurally and individually, for those seeking to engage with the federal policy space. 
So this session, we want this session to be an inclusive, collegial, and informative roundtable conversation, which will take the approximate following structure. I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. They'll answer a series of questions. Then we'll get into the roundtable Q&A, which is really the meat of this conversation. And then we'll have an audience Q&A session. Um, I would also ask for the sake of time and flow of the conversation that any questions which arise during the roundtable be held until the audience Q&A or submitted via the chat and then we will answer them during that time period. So now I want to move on to uh, ask our panelists to introduce themselves. So when you do this, please answer, tell us who you are, what you do, why this topic is important to you and why you agreed to speak today. So I think we should go popcorn style for this and I will start us off with asking VJ to introduce himself to us. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us, especially on a Saturday. It's great to be with you all. Uh, I'm Vijay Lamai. I'm a climate and health scientist at NRDC. That's the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're um, a big environmental advocacy organization working to protect human health and the natural systems on which all of life, human and non-human, depends. Um, I've been with NRDC almost four years, and my expertise is really on the intersection between climate change and human health. Um, particularly in this panel as it relates to air pollution standards set at EPA and the ongoing effort to clean up the air quality in this country and improve our climate response in the, in the process. So today's session really excited me because um, I've been fortunate to do a lot of advocacy in the federal space in my short time at NRDC and have learned quite a lot, um, seen quite a lot, um, some of it good, some not so good. So I'm really curious to chat with my other co-panelists who I'm really honored to be speaking with today and um, hear about their experiences and also ways in which we can improve the longer term sort of trajectory here when we think about training future leaders to weigh in more effectively in the federal policy space. There's such a need for a more comprehensive input. So thanks all. Let's do James. <laughs> So remember who you are, what you do, and why this topic is important to you and why you agreed to speak today. Well, let me begin by saying how we don't care if you change why stand up at up below. James Rowling, if you match up, you know, switch on to a quote or yate, want to I greet you uh, today from my heart with a handshake. Uh, I'm known as James Rowling. I'm coming to you from the Black Hills of South Dakota. I'm also a citizen of the Roadwood Sioux Tribe. I want to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity to be with you today and appreciate uh, the topic and and um, what we're going to get into today, um, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of these um, these these talks here this past year, um, really with the idea of advancing and advocating for indigenous interest on everything related from climate change, energy, healthcare, uh, traditional knowledge, and, and education. And I think that uh, we need more indigenous voices. Period. And we need to come up with with uh, with partnerships and, and actions and activities that really begin to build on this, this, whole, this whole JEDI or justice, equity, diversity, inclusion framework. And so I'm, I'm always um, I'm pleased and willing to, to come to the table and speak on these issues, certainly from my, uh, my experience and my knowledge as a tribal member, but also with my role at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, it, I think it's important that higher educational institutions you know, take a leadership role in advancing indigenous issues, and indigenous rights. And I think we both can do that, you know, from within as faculty, staff, and such, but also the type of research, the type of education that we do um, going forward. I do believe that uh, this work also led, lends to the current administration's interest in supporting Indian country around the idea of nation-to-nation nation -to -nation consultation, all those aspects of um, who we are as tribal nations. And to remind the audience, remind the people again that, that we're still here, that um, we've developed a sense of resilience, but we have a long way to go. So I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Again, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, Catalina. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you so much um, to the facilitators for inviting me to participate with this in this wonderful program, but with such a powerful lineup of panelists, I'm really honored to be here. And I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional land of the Narragansett Nation in Rhode Island. 
I'm thankful for their contributions and stewardship of this land since time immemorial and for the perseverance in our communities today, despite widespread historic territorial appropriation and genocide, I am thankful for their presence. I'd also like to acknowledge that Southern Rhode Island where I live was the site of the largest African slave holdings in New England. And it's not possible to decouple the two as records indicate African and indigenous captives in this region on appropriated land. So to center my contributions to this conversation today, I'll share a few things about myself, a little bit different maybe than some of the other panelists. So my name is Catalina Martinez, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I work for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Ocean Exploration. And I come to work on issues of justice, equity, inclusion, and diversity um, in STEM specifically through lived experiences, right? And also through the building of a professional portfolio in a variety of spheres over several decades. So I was honored to be asked to join this panel. Um, I grew up uh, maybe a little differently than most people who are on this uh, session today, but maybe this will resonate with some of you. I grew up in a hardworking Cuban immigrant family of little means, mostly living with my grandparents. I was pulled out of school often as a child to help care for my sick grandmother and to work to help the family in other ways. My grandparents believed that girls didn't need an education and that only boys should go to school. Um, and again, some of you in the audience might, this might resonate with you. Um, and not surprisingly, I dropped out of high school at 16. And at that point I left home and began the long journey to obtain the education of my choosing. And after many twists and turns, I'm here today. And I make sure to use my positionality and any semblance of influence that I might have to always seek ways to amplify the voices of those on the margins, to break down barriers to entry, persistence and success, right? For those of us who come from challenging circumstances and for those in marginalized spaces and groups who remain so sorely underrepresented in our STEM spaces and places and to encourage others to do the same where and when they can, to lift others up as you move through your journey, right? So I share all of this just to say that each of us comes into every space with complex intersectional identities that may be vastly different than how we're perceived by others. So when you look at me here in this little Zoom box, maybe you couldn't have guessed most of my uh, background. Inclusive science communication is important and it's complicated, right? So I look forward to our discussion today and to sharing this space with this incredible group of panelists and facilitators. Thank you. And most certainly not least, Andres. Well, thank you, Christina. Catalina, wow, I've got to follow you. <laughs> well, welcome and thank you everyone. Thank you, Compass. And what a, like it's been said before, what a great panel. This is, this is really uh, fantastic. And what a great way to spend our Saturdays uh, the executive director of Green 2.0. We are a 50C3 nonprofit organization, and we're the only one organization of its kind doing what we do across the country. And that is taking a look at foundations, taking a look at nonprofit NGOs, taking a look at Congress and saying, we need to culturally change, you need to culturally change, you need to change, or else we're not going to have a future of environmentalists we aren't doing enough, we're not doing it quick enough. It's not enough, and I was telling uh, some of the panelists the other day, it's not enough to have a seat at the table. Those, those at the table need to have a voice. So we absolutely, our work, our mission is to make sure that there is a cultural change, that communities of color have a seat, have a voice, and are part of the conversation, are leaders in the conversation, are those, making opportunities for others and our future. And that's what Green 2.0 Green 2.0 does. And again, I'm really excited to be here and have a wonderful conversation today. All right, thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. Um, at this point, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Heather who will lead our roundtable Q&A session. Thanks, Christina. Yeah. Um, feel very um, lucky to be here with all of you today. So thanks for those, those wonderful introductions, getting to know you a little bit um, as, as people, as well as kind of your professional background. Um, so I'm gonna kick off with a question. Uh, as Christina said, you know, in her introduction, we've seen a, a big change in the Biden administration and, and how they 
they talk about themselves and the goals that they want to achieve around sort of expertise in the role of science um, and, and inclusivity and diversity. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak from what you think is the opportunity that we have um, right now uh, within this federal, uh, within this current administration, within federal policymaking um, to uh, include, you know, to, to be more diverse, to include more of these voices, um, ways of knowing um, diverse identities, um, to have this potential cultural change. Uh, what, what are the opportunities we have? And, and likewise, what are some of the barriers we are still facing? What are the challenges? Uh, so, and you know, for the sake of our panelists, um, you're all welcome to contribute. You all don't have to answer each each question. So, um, I'll leave it up to you if you feel like you want, you have um, something to offer on this particular topic. We have a bunch of questions coming up. So, um, would anyone like to start? Andreas, great, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Always the it's always good to have someone starting off first. Everyone's like the <laughs> question, the Q and A, right? Everyone waits until that first question. But to answer your question, Heather, and it's a great question, very timely. We have an opportunity that we haven't had in the last four years, in the last administration. We have an opportunity to make change coming from all the way at the top. When President Biden ran, one of his pillars that he ran on was diversity, was climate change, was to work on these issues. And so right now is the time, the best time we've had in a while to actually work on these issues not only coming from the White House, but going into the administration and different agencies, as well as Congress. You know, and so right now, one of the best things is we have a president who's pushing on these issues and pushing on his staff and administration to, to really work on this and make it a priority. Though at the same time, Heather, one of the biggest hurdles is what kind of time frame do we have? Mm -hmm. What is going on with Congress? How long do we have for those that are interested in pushing these ideas to be in power, to be able to hold committee hearings, to be able to really look at organizations, foundations, and the entire uh, spectrum of the environmental sector and say, we need to change, we need to prioritize diversity. What makes me nervous is that our, our window isn't a, a very big window. And so we need to be pushing as much as we can, not tomorrow, not in the future, not next year, but we need to push right now. Thank you, Andres. Yeah, Catalina, great. Yeah, thank you, Andres. That's so important to hear from leaders like you out there in the field. And you're so right. I mean, I've been with NOAA in the federal government for almost 20 years now. And what we're seeing come out of this administration, these White House executive orders with a laser focus on justice and equity is not something I've ever seen. I don't know if this has ever been done before. So this could be a short window of opportunity, but I'm hoping that the momentum that is built you know, internally within these federal spaces, but also externally um, in the spaces that we can potentially influence um, that that momentum is maintained and, and continued. The challenges are enormous, right? We know that the structure and function of these systems, these entities, these you know, federal spaces, academia, all of these gatekeepers, right, of opportunity and resources, we know that the structure and function of them isn't working for everyone. You know, it, in, in order for us to really reimagine a new way forward, which we now have the opportunity to potentially do that, looking at justice and equity as you know, the framework for how we reimagine this. We have to make sure that everyone is brought to the table. This is an all hands on deck challenge that needs all hands on deck as we reconceptualize how to move forward. So looking and mitigating these barriers and challenges um, and filters that we know are at the front end of these opportunities and these spaces and places and mitigating them. Um, and also creating new opportunity, bringing the right voices to the table. There's so many challenges, but this opportunity could be um, short-lived. So we're just thankful, I'm thankful personally to know that leaders like you are out there pushing, pushing because these executive orders come with mandates. It's not just, you know, language that get, gets shoved out the door. These, there are equity assessments happening at these federal institutions. Equity teams are being assembled. They're looking at how they can level the playing field to those we, who are clearly shut out of these opportunities through these assessments. So the work is being done. 
Um, but having leaders like you out there pushing um, is so important. Thank you, James, yeah. You know, my, my comment would be is you, uh, this, the appointment and confirmation of Secretary Holland, um, really for the first time ever in the history of our country, an American Indian person has been um, placed in that leadership position. I think that's important because as a native woman, indigenous woman, she understands, she understands who we are as native people. Um, Congresswoman and also a local leader from Laguna Pueblo, she's had vast experience working on tribal issues, particularly the big issues like tribal sovereignty and why that still matters today. Uh, I think uh, that opportunity is important. I think those of us who work uh, in the field, so to speak, you know, are, are organizing and working ways to support those initiatives that, uh, that she's putting forward. I think the Bears Ears National Monument is a classic example of how uh, different coalitions of people can come together to, to address a, a, a wrong and make it right again. Um, I think that um, as, as the first Native women secretary, uh, I think she's going to be a great inspiration for our, our Native young people who is our fastest growing demographic in our communities. So I think that how we support and how we work with Secretary Holland and her administration is important. Um, I just uh, heard uh, yesterday that one of my colleagues from the Rosewood Sioux Tribe is going to be appointed as Undersecretary to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So there is a commitment to diversify government. And I think that's been one of the recommendations going forward is how do we, how do we bring not only in diverse voices, but in, in our interest, uh, Indigenous people who really understand our issues, who are really committed to our issues and really have the expertise to work on those issues to come up with solutions. That, um, that have been longstanding for many years. So that'd be my, uh, my response. Thank you, James. Yeah, VJ. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with what my fellow panelists have offered. Um, in terms of the barriers, you know, I think about the timelines here, our ours are certainly on the clock uh, in terms of just the political reality and the window closing, like Andres mentioned, but also just the you know scientific reality of the climate problem, for example, um, and the need to act swiftly. Um, I think we're also up against the complexity of the federal rulemaking process, which is really hard for even people who study, you know, worked in that space for years and years to understand unwinding all of the terrible damage that was done over the past four years is an enormously complicated project. And unfortunately, you know, right now, for example, we're faced with multiple overlapping deadlines to weigh in on all sorts of key rulemakings when it comes to science and health. And unfortunately, those deadlines function to exclude the same voices that have been excluded for decades, if not longer at this point. And so we really need those who are you know, in the system, um, folks at my organization and others to lift up, make space for voices that really haven't been represented in this space. Because unfortunately, the deadlines that we're up against function to just basically support the default situation in which we continue to exclude really valuable voices in these, these role makings. Thanks, BJ. Yeah. So hearing, I mean, hearing that quite a few that, that there is, you know, on one hand, this, this opportunity that we have this like uh, interesting moment in time where we can make some progress um, and capitalize on sort of, you know, the, um, the focus, as we said, on, on inviting um, new and different and more inclusive voices into these processes. On the other hand, we still have a lot of barriers to work through. Like VJ said, you know, there's um, very structural things uh, that, are, that are keeping folks out. Um, so I'm curious to follow up on that question with um, another question, which is, you know, what, what in your opinion can we do or what needs to be done to really create these long-term pathways, um, pathways of access for people who traditionally have not been part of part of the decision-making process, part of the federal process. And I think we can talk about it both from, um, from inside the, the federal government kind of institutionally, but then also for, for folks um, who may be in academia or um, sort of other institutions outside of outside of the federal space? Um, how can we make those pathways um, for them to also be contributing uh, to solutions to policy? Yeah, Andres, you want to kick us off again? Good. Yeah, I, I guess I'll jump in here again. Uh, okay. I, I think three things to this. Uh, one, it's what James said. 
it's supporting our leaders. It's supporting those who are working to, to prioritize diversity within all systems, whether it's our congressional leaders, whether it's our state and local leaders, the administration, wherever we can find ways to be supportive when we see a path for, a pathway forward, where we see our, our communities of color uh, leaders being put in places of, of power where they finally will have a voice for the community. So supporting uh, those, those individuals and those uh, elected officials is one, building coalitions is another. We can't mm -hmm. do this alone. We at Green 2.0 realize that unless we have the help of Compass, unless we have the help of our wonderful partners at NRDC, you know, and, and so many more, it takes, and it, it takes everyone to be working and caring about these issues for there to be actual change. Pushing one lever isn't enough. We need to push as many levers at the same time. And then the last and third part is accountability. We need to always make sure that we're holding those organizations, those leaders uh, accountable for their actions, making sure that we stay on top of the work that they are or are not doing. Because if one thing that this year has taught us at Green 2.0 is that actions have consequences. And one part of that is you see, you've seen so many organizations where diversity wasn't a priority, where there was mismanagement of staff, where staff wasn't treated with the respect that they deserve, um, volunteers, members uh, as well, leadership has, has had to step down. So those are actions that have consequences. And so we need to make sure that we're holding um, those with power very accountable for their actions. Thanks, Andre. I'll, um, I'll jump in and say um, that, um, Again, I started out with this idea of a nation to nation relationship. I think that uh, one thing that, that happened uh, in, in the Obama administration was the White House Council on Tribal Nations. And I think that is gonna be reinstated and where we bring our tribal leadership to Washington and continue those discussions. Um, I think that's all always about building trust, good faith and respect for tribal, the tribal federal relationship. Uh, you know, that's an ongoing long-term um, long effort um, again, I think that appointing, again, uh, Native people who have expertise in Native affairs in all levels of government, where they can make decisions. And for instance, nominating federal judges who understand federal Indian law. I mean, those judges who understand the federal trust and treaty obligations, uh, working on chronic underfunding in tribal nations, I think are all needed. And so I think we have to do those now. I know there's efforts to do that, so that'd be my, uh, my initial comments. BJ, BJ, and then oh, we'll first. Oh, Catalina, great. Yeah, yeah. that sounds good. Oh, well, thank you. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that I'm here speaking on behalf of myself, right? I'm not, as a federal agent, I am not here speaking on behalf of the federal government. Um, we made that clear in my last panel. I should have done that at the beginning of this one. Um, and I think I may be the only Fed on this panel. So I am not here speaking on behalf of, I am here on a Sunday uh, with my own perspectives from working for the government for the past 20 years. But it's not easy, right? And as we've heard from our incredible panelists, individual accountability matters, uh, mandates, requirements matter, um, as do assessing all process and procedure um, for you know, barriers to entry. So ensuring that opportunities are equitable and just, that's no small task, right? And doing these, these things simultaneously is no uh, small undertaking, right? Um, and the pressures have to come from all areas. And as we've also heard, ensuring that we, you know, the, the federal government can't represent a community that, that they don't have the proper perspectives at the table for. So ensuring that the workforce also is diverse that the gatekeepers, the leaders, the deciders are diverse. Um, you know, we had a conversation preparing for this panel about how we're, you know, there is this push to make sure that review panels are diverse, right? That's a push. A lot of us end up getting tapped for lots of review panels, right? But even if you have a diverse representation on review panels, we can still look at your applicant flow data and see that these folks are being filtered out, that these communities are not getting in the door. And that often has to do with the fact that although you may have a diverse panel, the gatekeepers are not diverse. Those who make the decisions are not diverse, right? So you have to simultaneously consider how you're going to diversify um, your workforce at all levels 
And again, if that's not happening simultaneously, you end up with perpetuating the same barriers. Um, so, you know, Dr. Vernon Morris was on our last panel. He's at Arizona State University now, and he, he um, has worked with large community um, of scholars of color in the academic space and federal spaces um, to consider ways that the federal government can potentially be most impactful on this journey that we may only have a, a small window for. And I can give you very quickly his five elements that I wrote down because he's so brilliant are you know, ensuring that the opportunities that are developed are fully inclusive and equitable, right? That you make sure that you have this full spectrum of community stakeholders um, at the table as you conceptualize these opportunities, addressing and mitigating the barriers that we know are inherent in the structure and function of these spaces and opportunities and holding accountability um, at the forefront um, for everything from um, awardees as well as the federal um, opportunities, that the quality of the participation is equitable and advancing and requiring that the ideation and the co-production of knowledge is diverse, right? So if you're going to reimagine your way forward and you want a different outcome, you better have the right perspectives at the table as we've uh, heard from our other panelists. And you have to lead by achieving a diverse, inclusive and equitable workforce, um, centering humanity in all that we do. And in STEM, that is not often the case. So that's a new mindset mm -hmm. that hopefully um, can be re-engaged. Thank you. Yeah, no, you, I think you stole my thunder, Kathleen. I, I agree totally that um, with what you and especially Andre said about capacity, I think that is, for me, front and center, the number one goal right now is building critical mass of marginalized voices within all these institutions, academics, nonprofits like mine. I've seen firsthand being on big coalition calls with inside baseball players who know the system and aren't used to hearing from younger folks or people of color or you know um, other voices that they traditionally haven't listened to and having critical mass, having people to check in with after a call and say, hey, that didn't sound right. What, what do you think? You know, is so important and something I didn't really think about before I had that support system in place. Um, and yeah, I totally agree with what you said, Catalina. I, I think a healthy skepticism from funders, from members, from people who follow like my organization on social media, that are we actually doing what we say we're doing in our mission statement, right? Are we being held accountable? Are we being transparent about advancing uh, inclusive processes, especially when it comes to all of our activity at the federal level? Um, I'd like to see more of that. Thanks, BJ. Yeah, following on to that, I know, Andres, when we talked, uh, pre, you know, kind of getting ready for this panel, you mentioned the accountability piece and, and how much of that is tied to, to funding um, itself. I'm, I'm wondering if you have a, just a little bit more to say, kind of following on to VJ's comments there. Absolutely. And, and I will say, I'll take this opportunity, uh, Heather, to say, Green 2.0 does an annual report card where we look at how organizations are doing when it comes to being transparent, how, it, how they come to, uh, when it comes to their hiring, their board placement of people of color. And, and, and I'm happy to say uh, NRDC has always been a partner with Green 2.0 on this and, and they will be part of our report card this year, which is, which is fantastic. So uh, thank you, BJ, for your participation, your organization's um, willingness to, to be open and transparent because it's very important to have partners like you and like Compass. Um, the foundation piece, that's such an important piece. How do you get organizations to be transparent, to want to work on these issues. There's the there's the the good, the bad, and the and, and in a way, and the good way is you you have this leadership idea that they want to change the culture, that they see that it's important for their staff and their members and their volunteers, and they get it and they understand. And even I've always said nothing worse than an organization or foundation or or whoever it may be. Uh, just not caring and willing, and turning their back and saying, we're not even going to try. If an organization or foundation, whoever it may be, tries and stumbles, at least they're working toward doing it the right way, right? So in a perfect world, all the organizations and foundations are working toward this, but it's not a perfect world. And a lot of times organizations, especially, refuse to want to participate, refuse to want to prioritize diversity. So what do you do? 
and it's going back to what Christine and I were talking about a little bit earlier, which is push, pulling all these levers at once. And one of the levers Green 2.0 uses is, listen, if you're not going to work on this and you don't find it absolutely a necessity to do so and don't understand why, organizations are funded by foundations. And so one of our one of the ways we work is foundations have said to us at Green 2.0, if there are organizations that are not willing to actually work on this and don't want to prioritize diversity, call us. And you better believe that when there is an organization out there that we try to talk to and they are turning their back on this critical timely issue, you better believe we find out who is funding them, who their top funders are, and we're picking up a phone call and making sure that those funders know. Because at the end of the day, Heather, that reflects 100% on the foundation. So I we say to them, is this organization is turning their back on this issue? Does that mean that your foundation doesn't care about this, doesn't believe in this, isn't part of this mission, doesn't want to work on these issues? Because that's what you're telling me when you fund these organizations year after year. So that, that Heather, is one of the levers we pull. And, and foundations, let me tell you, they, they respond pretty quickly because for the, Almost always, foundations are going to say, that is absolutely not what we believe. That is absolutely not in our, in our makeup. We want, to work the, you know, we want to work with you, not against you. And, and they are sometimes very surprised and shocked by some of the responses that organizations are giving to us when it comes to prioritizing diversity. Thanks, Andres. I think that's a great example of how it takes so many different people working together on this issue, kind of coming at it, like you said, from those different angles um, and kind of pulling those different change levers to actually kind of move things forward in the direction that we want to go. Um, okay, so uh, my, my final question here, and then um, we'd love to hear some from, from everybody who's out there listening to us right now. Um, so we've been talking a lot about kind of the institutional level, like these kind of broad um, ideas about how we can how we can make change and, and move the needle a bit on this, but I'd love to bring it down to sort of an individual level, um, because I think ultimately that's what we all are, individuals kind of working in this space to, to make change, to, to do better um, with all of this, um, but it's hard, it's hard work um, to, to do this. And so I think for people who are um, trying to do this more, you know, particularly people of color who may find themselves in the position of engaging with the federal with federal policy um, in these spaces, what kind of support um, do you think is needed or can we offer um, for those who are kind of in working in policy or engaging in policy or or, or or want to engage in policy more? So bringing it down to sort of that individual level and how we can, what can we offer them? What kind of support is needed? Anyone want to kick, kick us off? Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, let, I'll let James go first. Yeah, Andre, since oh, okay. you spoke last. Yeah, perfect. Okay, Thank well, you. Yeah. I am. I, uh, I swear I wanted to touch back what Andre said about philanthropy. I think um, I think the big term that I'm hearing today is decolonizing philanthropy. And um, I think that, you know, as First Nations or Indigenous people, you know, we've been a recipient of so many different kind of programs, you know, from the outside. And I think I'm hoping that in this generation, there will be a change in how um, philanthropy uh, is working or does work again in indigenous communities, uh, in particular where I live in South Dakota. We still have some of the poorest counties in America in 2021, and they're primarily um, located within American Indian reservations. And I don't know how many millions of dollars have been spent uh, on those efforts, to, you know, to raise um, our people and raise our standard of living, raise our health care, raise our educational levels, and raise opportunities. But we still struggle there, and I know that philanthropy does have a role. And so I will, I'll say that I think one of the solution is, is really is to invest in local leadership, uh, build that leadership up. And so that, you know, there are opportunities to make decisions on how the, how the money is, um, is brought in and also how they evaluate uh, those projects and what kind of evaluation indicators are needed so that the local solutions are really tailored for the local people rather than that. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the other question, Heather, is that, you know, I work with data uh, data, well, I'm going to bring data into this issue, this topic here is, and the term that I've been working with the last few years is called data sovereignty. And I think this speaks really to how decisions are being made and as an example of what local efforts need to be done. 
again, I, I come from a tribal nation perspective, so I'm going to again say it, the federal trust responsibility is important. Uh, there needs to be technical assistance, there needs to be direct, direct um, financial support. Um, I think building our data capacity and infrastructure is really important, and that can be a cut across other kinds of issues. Um, again, you know, when we talk about these things in this context, I, I'm always reminded about my elders and my knowledge holders when I come in and talk about these sort of things, and, and they also remind me again about the past and how the lack of trust, the lack of trust has really impacted uh, these programs from the government to philanthropy to science to um, universities and such. And you know that's still a big deal. Um, you know, again, um, you know, people come in and want to do some things with us, but then we don't know who they are, mm-hmm. and they don't know who we are, and so we start at that position, and it's very difficult at times to really to to move things forward. But I do think that um, I do think that part of the solution is really building a workforce. I think I heard that today in this panel. Um, I mentioned that our our fastest demographic in any country is our is our people under thirty years old. And so my question to all of us again is what are opportunities for those young people to pursue? I think COVID-19 again demonstrated a vulnerability of First Nations and tribal people again, that we still lack many of these basic infrastructure things that we all take for granted here. So I'm gonna remind people again that we still, and the Navajo Nation is an example of that when they're asking our people to wash their hands. How can you wash your hands when you don't have any running water? And, and that's generational. So we're still dealing with intergenerational poverty we're still, we're still dealing with things that were taken away from us as indigenous people and, and things that impacted our culture. So, so we, we say those things as a reminder again, not to sort of place judgment, but saying that to understand us, to work with us and to, to, to look at solutions working together, I think those need to be ex- acknowledged. And it may be even to push this idea of reconciliation. Um, I, uh, I'm starting to do more work in Canada with the First Nations and British Columbia. And they talk a lot about reconciliation again between the, the province, the federal government and the First Nations people there. And so I do think that um, Secretary Holland is pushing something forward in terms of how the government looks at all the things that impacted us in particular boarding schools. And the thinking about this idea of intergenerational trauma. I think all those issues are have impact. We can have the best solution here, but if we don't deal with intergenerational trauma I don't know how we're going to make the impact that we can. So those are things I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Thanks so much, James. Other thoughts on the panel that are following on to James's comments or um, on the question that I asked around support for individuals? I'll just say, um, James, thank you so much for all that you shared. And, you know, we know that there has to be a time dimension associated with centering justice and equity work, right? And acknowledging practices and harms caused, correcting for them in some semblance of a way, some kind of way, Um, and then addressing these institutional and structural inequities, disadvantages that are built into our current systems that continue to perpetuate the the privileged and those who are oppressed, right? And how do we then ensure full community participation um, in the present as we reimagine the structure and function of how to move forward under these current times and conditions? in order to design the future in a more equitable and just manner. These are not easy things, right? Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I think, you know, we all have some, some sphere of influence, you know, and I try to use my uh, sphere of, of whatever that influence is on the inside in, in one, you know, small federal agency uh, to really address certain areas that I feel I can be most impactful in. And as individuals, as this question started, there are things we can do as individuals, you know, look at your sphere of influence, look at the orbit that you can, you know, operate within, who's missing, who's not at the table, look around, you know, are you leading in a space you should be amplifying a voice, Um, you know, should you be taking a step back? How can you build bridges to opportunity? How can you expand the table and make sure that there are more voices represented? 
How can you identify, flag, and mitigate barriers to entry, persistence, advancement, and success for people we know are not uh, entering those spaces, right? Um, and so I just you know, implore all those on, on the call today, look around you and think about what your sphere of influence is as an individual and try to make an impact. Thank you. Thanks, Catalina. One of the things that we talked about earlier too was um, around uh, that I think goes along with this is, is supporting mental health too. Um, and as we, you know, deal with, uh, we have to deal with things like intergenerational trauma before we can even move forward. Um, and so what I think the resources that we have around, you know, supporting mental health for those who are engaging in this space um, can be a really important piece of this. Okay, any other comments onto that? All right, I'll, Christina, I know you've been kind of uh, handling questions. So do you, are there some yes, audience we, questions to raise? Thanks. We have a couple of audience questions that have come in. Um, one very long one that is going to be excellent <laughs> that I know Andres has a lot of thoughts on. Um, and then a, I'll kick it off with this first question. Um, thinking about the reason we're all here and thinking about science communication specifically um, and the impact and kind of the, the space that science communication has between us and our panelists as individuals um, and the federal government, what role does communicating science have in your ultimate, um, in your ultimate efforts to leave an impact or to um, help break down these barriers? Where do you see science communication in that center for you? That's a question from the audience as well. I did not just make that up. Well, uh, I'll, I'll jump in and say that, um, you know, you know, for, for, for my work, you know, um, I look at, I look at this idea of, um, of two ways of, two ways of seeing or two ways of knowing. And so I, I purposely work, you know, with Western approach to science as they understand the world and also work with an indigenous framework, you know, which is Lakota in my particular case. And I think that, you know, when we talk about things like climate change, um, I know um, my work is beginning to work internationally. And I know, um, for instance, at the last um, International Conservation Union meeting they had in Marseille, France, uh, one of the highlights or topics that was talked about from the leaders there of the world, I talked about the world of indigenous people and the indigenous people's knowledge and their role in um, helping mitigate or uh, turn around climate change. And so, you know, so I'm sitting here thinking, you know, and watching this stuff online and I'm thinking, well, well, that's great. I mean, at least there's, there's a recognition of things that we've already known, but what, but what is it, what's really happening here? You know, why are the world's, world's leaders get talking about the role of indigenous people and, and their knowledge to help address, address climate change? And, um, and I think that, you know, we're sort of starting to process that now. And, and again, we're leading into COP26 right now as well. We're going to have also representation there at COP26 this year again in, in Glasgow, Scotland. Again, the role of indigenous people, in particular indigenous women, um, working in this space now, putting together um, efforts to address uh, climate change and all the impacts thereof from climate change. So, so I think that, you know, for me, it's been that, um, you know, as indigenous people, you know, it's sort of a two edge kind of a two edge thing. You know, how much do we come out to places like this and talk about, you know, who we are and what we do and what we know versus what we don't. Because we know that, you know, in the past, a lot of our, our efforts and a lot of our knowledge have been appropriated, misappropriated and for someone else's benefit rather than ours or whether the world's. And so that's something that we have to, we have to work through always. It doesn't just stop with one event or one activity or one project or one research um, effort. It's an ongoing thing again. That's why I brought up the idea of sovereignty and self-determination. That's the framework that we can work under when we do this work and how we talk about the work and we, how we talk about solutions. And again, reminding our audience again and again that you know, we're, we're different. We're, 
we're not all the same as indigenous people. We may have some common values and common principles, but but we're different. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. So, so I'll stop there. Yeah, the just hearing a theme of of trust, the lack, the the loss of trust, and and how that is not even a factor in in terms of um, indigenous communities sharing their knowledge and and how that is something that has been abused for so long. So that's an incredibly important point. Um, BJ, I know you had you had your hand up, I believe. Sure. Yeah. No. Just to add to that, I think in terms of about, like how I think about my role in this space, um, one is just to think about the federal scientific enterprise where it's at, where we need it to be. We have, you know, Catalina, thank you so much for all of your work. I'm a former EPA scientist myself. That agency is effectively, you know, at the staffing levels that it was at in the 80s. Um, hundreds of scientists departed under the Trump administration, and there's a giant um, capacity gap to fill specifically on scientific expertise at the federal level. So we need more and more young people to think about working in the federal government, public service, as a noble and crucial part of the puzzle here in terms of addressing health disparities and the climate crisis, for example. Um, a lot of what I do is about synthesis, you know, doing the work to make sense of these piles of research studies on air pollution and translate them into plain English, not just for policymakers, but for the print media, for TV, for folks that are getting the message out and hopefully making it clear that as much as federal you know, laws like the Clean Air Act are designed to regulate one pollutant at a time, People in burdened communities are breathing in and exposed to multiple harms that are converging. These cumulative impacts are what people are actually suffering, and we more and more need our regulatory structures to reflect that, especially when it comes to understanding why we have these persistent health disparities. So there's a whole lot of work to do on the, on the federal level, of course, but that's sort of where I see things. Are there any other thoughts? We have a big question that I want to tackle in our last few minutes, and I know there will be lots of thoughts around it. Um, all right, so our last question, uh, one of the executive orders you referred to, the order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved committees through the federal government calls for establishing an interagency working group on equitable data. Many federal data sets are not disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender, disability, income, veteran status, or other variable. This executive order also states that this lack of data has cascading effects and impedes efforts to measure and advance equity, but some people are not comfortable with sharing this information with the US government. So I'm curious to hear what the panelists think about balancing trust, privacy, and accountability and measurability with that in mind. Uh, sure, let me let me kick it off here if that's all right with everyone on the panel. Uh, man, trust, uh, that, that's, a, that's a big one, right? And so I think that we absolutely need to make sure that when we're looking at data, when we're looking at the federal government organizations, foundations being transparent, answering staff, answering questions around diversity, we have to be extremely careful and responsible about how we do it. We have to be we have to do it in a way that's taking into account every single individual's wants or not wants. Uh, we can't, we need to be asking these questions, but we can't be feel, making anyone feel forced to be doing any of this. These questions are critical and important in helping frame and understanding what's missing. But at the same time, we can't take away a person's um, dignity, choice, uh, any of those things in that pursuit. So with that said, um, if, that, if that's understood, uh, one of the things that Green 2.0 has done because we heard about this lack of, of a roadmap from organizations and foundations and even from, from Congress was there's no way to start asking these questions. There's no specific document when it comes to the environmental sector. And so this year, Green 2.0 put out the first ever roadmap 
and I just put it in the chat. This is our first attempt at trying to give everyone a, a road to start on. Um, I like to think of this as a living document. It's any organization's first attempt at trying to do this. And so with any first attempt, are you gonna nail it completely? No. Are you gonna get everything right? Absolutely not. And so that's why I think of it as a living document because if James looks at it or VJ and Catalina look at it and they email us and say, hey, you're, why'd you do this? Or you missed this? Or why didn't you think of this? You're probably 100% right. We probably did, but we were trying to do the best we could. We did this in under a year because so many different entities were calling for it. And we saw that it had to be done and it, this work needed to be started on. Um, and so every year we plan on updating it from the questions, suggestions we get throughout the year. But we have shown this to Congress. When we release this, 35 organizations, individual organizations, including Compass, including NRDC, all pushed it out on the same day. I can't remember when any report was pushed out by 35 organizations in one day at the same time. So that shows you that there is a want, there is a need, there is a desire, and there is a place for something like this because we need to start somewhere as a community. We need to understand what the actual data is out there. What are the challenges that we are facing? And we need to start figuring that out. We needed to start figuring that out yesterday, actually, but we're gonna be figuring that out moving forward. And so I think that with resources like this, with other resources that other organizations have out there, uh, you know, the fact that the, the house has a diversity committee that's looking at what the setup is, what the makeup is of, of staff on the Hill, the fact that members of Congress and Congress as a whole, as well as the Biden administration are being held accountable. The fact that we as a, as a country are pushing them, pushing them, meaning our, our government, those who are running all of these important programs to be better, to take and listen to and bring in as a leader, uh, are, are leaders of color and communities that are most impacted by climate change says a lot. So um, this has been um, a, a labor of love and, and we'll continue to work on this every single year, just like we do with our report card. Thank you so much. Catalina? Yeah, we had this conversation as we were preparing that, you know, mm -hmm. I just put a link that just came to me uh, this past week um, into the, the chat. Uh, it's a challenge by the Office of Science Technology Policy um, at the White House around these kinds of questions, right? And, and you know, justice and equity around data um, is a real big challenge. And as we heard the theme of, my, of our last panel, as well as this panel, uh, talking about federal inclusive SciComm, trust is inherently problematic. Uh, relationships matter. Mm -hmm. um, in all of these spaces and places, you know, relationships can be eroded over time based on priorities coming out of particular administrations and then have to be rebuilt um, upon a shifting uh, administration at times. And that's happening in a lot of environmental spaces like the EPA, NOAA and others. Um, so uh, relationships are essential and demographic data is inherently problematic. We all know that it has to be voluntary, first of all. Um, the fear of checking those boxes is real in a lot of different communities. And I can speak to the um, Hispanic Latino immigrant community. Uh, you know, the fear that that data is going to be used for evil instead of good, not understanding how the data will be used. Um, so the fears are real. So we know that the demographic data has inherent challenges, but it's all we got. You know, just for something as basic or small as, say, an internship program, I try to help groups uh, mitigate barriers to entry for uh, those who are not part of the dominant culture by looking at their requirements, their, you know, processes, their procedures and flagging the barriers and something as basic as collecting demographic data um, on those who are applying for um, your, your programs is not something everybody does. So a lot of these programs, although we can look at those programs and know that there are problems, 
um, in terms of who is receiving these opportunities. We can't prove it without them collecting demographic data. So one of the things that I'm so thankful for for Green 2.0 is that they are encouraging people to and giving them guidance on how to do this. And it's, it's also challenging because we're not a monolith, right? So we go in and we look at these, uh, these demographics and none of those boxes really represent us. So it's hard to do comparisons across data sets often because the demographics are collected differently. Um, and so it's all we have, it's important, um, but in order to assess applicant flow data in any way, in any kind of way, you have to start collecting the data somehow, right? And language changes, it evolves. Um, and so you, you really do need guidance from people like Green 2.0 and others to look at, you know, what is the current language that we should be using in order to do this as well. So we're not causing harm and trauma in the process. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, for your perspective on that, Catalina. Um, looking at, we are running up against time right now. And I just want to offer any last words to any of our panelists. You guys have been truly excellent. And, and I want to make sure that you have the space to, to leave us with any comments, thoughts, words of action. Okay. Yeah, this is James. I'll, um, I'll just, I'll, my comment will be around this, the last topic about data. Uh, I, I think um, the process of data collection, you know, with and for Indigenous people is critical for empowerment of our communities and for identifying our needs. Indigenous communities should have the right to have their data primarily and aggregated returned to them, mm -hmm. their use, noting the importance of the confidentiality of such data, particularly as it applies to individuals who have participated in conducting data collection exercises. So, so we should participate, but also we should look at ideas like rights-based indicators as well. And I think that, um, I think Compass, uh, let me put a word for Compass. I think Compass has an opportunity to provide leadership in these areas, and I'm hoping that in the future, Compass will have um, of an Indigenous First Nations um, tribal initiative that looks at all these big issues, as we talked about today, and I'd be happy, and I know other Indigenous leaders would love to participate in something like that. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here and participate. Thank you so much for that, James. Your truly, your confidence in us is truly, it's heartwarming. We love it, and we are so excited to work on these on these projects with you, um, especially our ongoing project that we have with you as well. I want to offer a very, very heartfelt thank you to our panelists. Each and every one of you has contributed so greatly to this conversation, and I am ecstatic to have had this conversation. And I want to thank all of the attendees as well. Your questions were excellent. Um, and if you have any questions, Compass has a booth in the exhibitor hall and you can feel free to send us an email at any point. So with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful Saturday and thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.